A, a pleasure to welcome Dr. Tony Edwards, who's um, in charge of educational studies at Liverpool Hope University, uh, a historian by trade, lots and lots of experience within the field of education, um, internationally um, as well as in Britain, um, taught for a time in, um, in Greece, I think, and uh, I don't know if he's going to talk about that today, but obviously the, um, the culture and situation in Greece is, uh, is a, a problematic one, to, to say the least. Um, I think today he's going to focus, however, on um, the topic of technology, which I think Tony's been interested in for a number of years in relation to, um, to education. Remember that um, you can text in your questions. I'll field the questions as usual and pass them on to Tony, who's going to speak for about half an hour. So... Without further ado, over to Tony Edwards. Thanks very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, you know, the classic technology hitch is the fact you have two microphones turned on at the same time. You actually get feedback. So if, um, if that becomes a problem, I'll switch microphones. I'll try not to move about too much because apparently I'm going to be a film star. This is, this is being recorded today. And it'll be a kind of interesting experience for me. And had I known I'd have worn my suit and tie and looked typically you know, uh, sort of very prestigious in my suit. But I'll just get on in my uh, slovenly clothes as I, I stand here. Okay, uh, we're gonna, I'm going to speak for about half an hour. And my theme for today is, uh, the, the theme for the, the talk that I'm going to give is what I call virtually virtual. And it's about the intersection between technology and education. And I know that Ian Gibson came to speak to you a couple of weeks ago and took one particular viewpoint or looked at technology in terms of being a thing that made change in education. And I'm going to extend uh, the things he talked about and also look at one particular thing in relation or uh, certainly the intersection between virtual worlds and education itself. And that's why the theme for my theme for today is uh, virtually virtual. Um, as Morgan has said, if you've got questions, simply text them to him. And even if you don't feel capable of texting them to him at the end, we can also take questions, uh, you know, um, as in the traditional way, by people identifying the questions and me responding to, to them accordingly. Okay, the first thing I want to do is to set the context for what I'm going to talk about. Now, I know Ian did a, a, an exercise with you where he asked you to kind of, or possibly one of the things that may, to, may have arisen from your, uh, when Ian did his particular talk, was the idea that technology has changed very, very quickly over what is a relatively short period of time. And if I think over my working lifetime to the kind of, the way technology is impinged on what I do, the changes are quite dramatic. And um, certainly when I started work, there wasn't an internet, uh, there weren't mobile phones, uh, there weren't kind of instant forms of uh, Web2 technology, you know, all the, techn uh, the communication technologies. So even in a relatively short period of time, um, technology has changed quite radically, or the impact of technology on all our lives, but particularly in education, has changed quite radically. I mean, it's feasible now, and I know you had, uh, when Ian came in, I think you did some uh, Skype connection with some somebody in, I can't remember where it was, was it South America or... Australia, uh, where that uh, person actually talked to you. I mean, that's the kind of thing that even 10 years ago would have been incredibly difficult to achieve. And one of the things that's made this possible, one of the changes in technology, has been the evolution of the computer. Uh, and to give you a very brief history of the evolution of the computer, um, the computer has been around as an idea for quite a long period of time. Some people argue, even for about 2,000 years, the Chinese uh, were playing around with a, even a very basic idea of what the computer was. I mean, obviously a mechanical device, but had some of the features of a computer. And then certainly in the 17th century, a guy called Blaise Pascal, who was a mathematician, uh, started to make a mechanical computer, which did computations. And then in the, the uh, 19th century, late 18th century, 19th century, there was a man called Charles Babbage, who was known as the father of the computer, and created a wooden device which was designed to uh, build or to work out tie tables for the Navy. And then that idea, the idea of computers, gets relatively lost for about 40 or 50 years. But then it suddenly reappears towards the end of the 19th century and really starts to take off again at the beginning of the Second World War. 
And uh, there was a computer called ENIAC, I think, uh, uh, which was based in America, which was a computer which was trying to decode things. So it was a, a device for decoding. And the reason I'm kind of uh, going through this potted history is because ENIAC as a computer would have occupied a room probably half as, about half the size. Okay, and if we look from ENIAC to my mobile phone, which has about X thousand times the, the capacity of ENIAC in the Second World War to this, um, we go from something which occupies the half, half of this room to something which you can put in your pocket. So what's happening is this, as far as processing devices are concerned. Things are getting cheaper. So it's not beyond the bounds of possibility for lots of people in this room. In fact, actually, if I ask the question, how many people don't have a mobile phone? And I'm really not surprised at the answer. So mobile phone technology is not just out there, it's available to everybody. The devices that we use are much faster than they were even five years ago. One of the frustrations I've had with technology is the fact that I buy a piece of technology, say a laptop computer, and I buy it today, and in three years' time, somebody comes along, or even two years, and says, listen, that's so slow, mate, it's in the dark ages. Chuck it out and buy a new one, because that's like a, piece of, a tablet in a, you know, uh, with a stone chisel in terms of its uh, capacity and speed. And things are getting faster, and they're getting smaller. Okay, the basis of a computer is a thing called a microchip. It's a little device that goes in the computer, and... 10 years ago, 15 years ago, you could actually hold them in your hand and see them. They were a physical entity. Today, they are incredibly small. Some are so small, you can hardly see them with a microscope, or you need a microscope to see them. So devices are becoming cheaper, they're working faster, and they are getting ever smaller. And that's the context in which I want to kind of uh, talk to you about the various things I'm going to talk about. Because things are getting cheaper, faster, smaller, they almost are beginning to have the appearance of intelligence. It's what Kurzweil uh, said was intelligent machines, and he's talking in 1992. So he's talking 20 years ago uh, that suddenly we have this evolution of things we call intelligent. Now, if you go in a car today and drive a car, certainly some of the cars I drive, they'll tell you if the brake lights failed, or they'll tell you various things about the performance of the car. Uh, you know, your battery's low or something like this. And it's almost like the machine has got a form of intelligence. It's looking at a particular si situation and it's making a decision. Now, 50 years ago, that was unheard of technology. But it surrounds us today uh, in, in our lives. Even, uh, you know, uh, computers uh, appear to uh, give you uh, pieces of information that you didn't necessarily want, but they tell you about the performance of the computer, they tell you about things that are going on inside it. It's almost like they're tapping you on the shoulder and saying, hey, do you realize I'm running out of memory? Almost like, uh, you know, if you were kind of sitting, revising for an exam and you were saying to your mate, do you realize I'm running out of memory as well? So these machines are beginning to have the appearance of intelligence. And because things are moving, they're cheaper, they're faster, and they're smaller, that appearance of intelligence is increasing. It's not far beyond the realms of possibility, and I think these devices already exist today, to have a fridge. I know, okay, inside your fridge is your bacon, your sausage, your whatever, your orange juice, whatever you have inside the fridge, and the packet inside the fridge will tell you I'm out of date. Now, currently, it'll tell you, you know, it's out of date simply because it's got, a, you know, it's got that information written on it. But it's feasible now to have microchips on the, on the packet of orange juice that can communicate with the fridge. And when you go to the fridge and open the door, it'll give you a reminder that says, do you realize the orange juice is out of date? You're taking a risk of you know, instant death if you drink this orange juice. Okay, So it needs to go in the bin. That's here. We have things called RF chips, radio frequency chips, tiny little things that you can put in clothing. And you go into shop, you buy a piece of clothing, and you take the piece of clothing home. And in theory, what that little chip does is send signals about, one, about your buying habits, but two, also, in theory, it can say where you are, because it's, it's so small on a piece of clothing, you can't possibly see it. So the areas that technology are 
uh, impinging or interacting in our lives increase. And the range of things in sophistication they can do also increase. And they can have the appearance of intelligence. And this is the context in which we're thinking about education currently. Okay, just a couple of other things about the, the machine. Um, this goes back to the thing that I was talking about, about little RF chips that go on clothing. They connect to networks. Now, my phone connects to a mobile network, but I can't see the network. It's invisible. When you have wireless devices that communicate with each other, you can't see the networks. They're invisible. So we're, increasingly, we're surrounded by invisible networks. And what those invisible networks allow us to do is to have things like mobile technology. Because if you go back 40 or 50 years ago and look at a telephone, the only way you could utilize or use a telephone would be to have that telephone connected to some wire which went into uh, a device and then went onto a telegraph pole and then went through the system. And it needed wires. It needed a physical connection. That physical connection has disappeared or is disappearing r really rapidly. And the other thing I want to talk about is another thing which is called speckle computers. They're tiny little chips. And again, they talk to each other. They don't need to be big to do things. So if you imagine, uh, and the example I had with this was um, uh, some kind of liquid was sprayed onto a, a, an engine. And the engine would, uh, these speckle con computers were contained inside the liquid that was sprayed onto an engine. And what it meant was that it could send information about the engine temperature back to a mainframe computer. So that's speckle computers. Now this is the the kind of range of things that can happen in terms of technology. Right. Now, one of the things is that as people who are potentially involved in education in whatever form or people who are studying education, uh, what we can't do is ignore the impact of technology. And what, what many writers are saying about technology, and particularly this chap Facer, is saying that... Uh, Technology and education, you can't dislocate the two. You have to consider both together. And because they're getting faster, cheaper, and smaller, that's an inevitable uh, impact that they're going to have between each other. I want to concentrate on three bits of technology, uh, possibly four. And the one I'm really interested in is the one that I'll deal with at the end. But I think, again, to give you information which sets the scene, I need to talk a little bit about these three things beforehand. The first thing I want to talk about, or to show you an example of, is enhancement technology. Mobile phone is a separate piece of kit from you, goes in your pocket, goes on your desk, forget it. You know, you forget it at home, and you think, oh God, I can't survive because I haven't got my mobile phone. There is a branch of technology which is a, about enhancing people. And I use the word enhancement cautiously because I don't actually mean enhancement. I'll give you an example of this. Say somebody loses a leg and they need a prosthetic device of some description. What you can have is a, an artificial leg. Now, in the past, that artificial leg has been a bit of machinery that you stick onto the stump of your leg and it has no connection to you apart from the fact that it's strapped on. Now, we have devices that can be connected to the neurosystem inside your, inside your body so that there are circumstances where you can actually move these prosthetic devices uh, and it becomes almost like another leg. It's an enhancement. Okay, we can, uh, people who've got uh, hearing difficulty, we can address hearing difficulties through using, um, uh, I often call them hearing aids, but they're much more than hearing aids. They're not things that you stick in your ear. There's a direct connection to you, the, the hearing system inside your, hear, your ear. They're add-ons. They enhance you. Now, if you take that logic a little bit further and think, okay, what if I could give somebody uh, enhance their brain capacity? Is that a good thing to do, to enhance their brain capacity? So, enhancement technologies, whilst on one hand can appear to have a kind of benign uses, use, they can actually be used in, very, in a very intrusive way to maybe improve somebody's ability to work or somebody's ability to think. And I've got a very small example here that I'll bring up now. And this is a newspaper article, and it's in The Guardian. And when I use the word technology, you can actually regard technology as not just a machine, but technology has got a very broad definition. definition. And in this case, this technology involves um, pills that you can give to people. And this report that's been published is about um, can you use uh, a, a technology, give somebody a pill, 
and this pill will do a number of different things. It'll be uh, make people uh, improve their thinking powers, their cognitive abilities. So you can see, if you could give somebody a pill and it would improve their cognitive ability, that has a direct impact on educational potential. Now this is not new technology. This is not futuristic. This is out, out there. There were surveys or certain kinds of stimulants uh, appear to improve br brain cognition. And there have been incidents in universities where students have taken certain drugs uh, which uh, purportedly have this effect and, and, you know, as a matter of course. So if they go and sit an exam, they take this artificial, this, this pill to improve their performance in exam. It raises a real moral issue, doesn't it? If you think about technology as being not just about machines but about things like, the you know, the science and technology about things like chemicals and things like that, where do we draw the line? Where do we say this is unacceptable? And if you think about the debate about sports people who take, well, there's been a, a big thing about Lance Armstrong in the newspapers recently in the Tour de France. And Lance Armstrong has been accused of serially cheating over seven Tour de France uh, wins. And there is a school of thought that says, so what? He just had better drugs than anybody else. What's wrong with that? There's equally another school of thought that says, that's really a serious stuff. You shouldn't be tinkering to that extent with people. You give them what you're given, and you should work with what you're given. Okay, so that's one example of how uh, a technology might impinge on education. The second thing I want to talk about, this is a video. I'm not sure how effective it will be. We'll see. What hit lab call a marker? But in the realm of augmented reality, I become something altogether different. And then move forward slowly. Actually, should just cover the marker back up. Yeah, there we go. That's right. Now, of course, this isn't entirely new. Hollywood has been mixing graphics and the real world for years in movies. The difference is, what used to take millions of dollars and months of work can now be done with a standard PC in seconds. And the applications are endless. Oh, that rocks! <laughs> Look at that! That's cool. The technology will change the way we see the world. A city street becomes an instant tour guide. A surgeon could place ultrasounds of organs over a patient's body. But it's children who will be the first to benefit. Jimmy Jones was a giant. He lived in the mountains and slept in a valley for his bed. The clouds were his blankets and the lake was his bath. Now this one could put mum and dad out of the job of bedtime story reading. It's called an eye magic book and as you turn each page a new scene springs to life off the page in 3D. This one tells the tale of a friendly giant. The images leap off the page. This could be the biggest thing to happen to books since the invention of the printing press. The images I'm seeing through the goggles are triggered by markers on the book. Each time I turn the page, a new scene springs to life. Well, perhaps the tailors could sew him some giant... I'm not going to show the whole of that. Um, it's actually on the... Uh, on the... Um, the PowerPoint itself, so if you want to look at it. Now, so two technologies there. One is enhancement technology, and that's about enriching adding additions and the other technology is this one here which is called augmented uh, reality and that's about um, adding things to what we see and hear every day in addition to what we see and hear every day so the example they gave there was a book uh, an augmented uh, and most of those devices with augmented reality require you to wear some form of glasses so you know if you go to the cinema and you look at uh, 3d cinema you can't go in and suddenly it's, it's 3D screen. You have to wear a pair of glasses. And I always think you look incredibly stupid when you do so. So it's always put me off doing those kind of things. Um, and, but you can see, you saw the book there. Imagine telling a story to a five-year-old and giving a five-year-old a pair of these glasses and suddenly that story comes to life. You've got 3D characters bouncing around the, the, uh, you know, the, the kind of glasses. Fantastic. Enhancements. If you could give somebody to improve their cognitive ability, they're struggling in school, they're finding life really difficult, here's a pill, take this pill. Fantastic. Improves your kind of cognitive ab abilities. So those are two kind of uh, pieces of technology in the, in the mix. The third piece of technology, which is I don't want to go into detail about as well, but is neuroscience and its impact with education. 
And neuroscience is about the study of the brain and about the way, the way the brain behaves. And in terms of education and our understanding of neuroscience, it's in its infancy. So at the moment, we dabble as educators with neuroscience. We don't really understand it. It's science. It's like, and, and education is a bit like science and an art combined. And we don't really make use of neuroscience. But there are new neuroscience uh, developments where we can actually see the mechanism of the brain working. We can do that now anyway through things like uh, MRI scans. But we've never been able to do it uh, in field work because the machinery is so big. But that machinery is reducing ever cheaper, ever faster, etc., etc., etc. So we're, le we're learning about how the brain works. And the theory is if you know about how the brain works, and you can understand, start to see pictures of people learning. So imagine somebody's learning, they're finding a concept very difficult to understand. You can see an image of the brain, you can find out what's, which, what bit is not going right, and you can do something to put that right through neuro neuroscience. This is not science fiction. This is here now. That's something I want you to go away with. I'm not talking about speculative things, you know, 50 years down the road. I'm talking about things that actually exist today. Right, the thing I actually want to talk about, the main thing is today, is those are the technologies that I think surround this particular thing. But the one thing I, I do want to kind of examine a little more deeply is about virtual worlds and how virtual worlds impact on education. And in virtual worlds, there are two, two kinds of virtual worlds which relate directly to education uh, or virtual activities that relate directly to education. One is what we call virtual schools. And the other is what we call virtual worlds. Now, with virtual schools, you all know what virtual schools are to a certain extent because you use Moodle. Now, Moodle doesn't exist, does it? It's a thing in cyberspace somewhere. Oh, it maybe exists as part of a piece of software. But you couldn't pick up Moodle unless you picked up your computer and walk it over here. It's in there. It's in the ether somewhere. And yet, you can access material from Moodle you could be sitting on a beach having your latest beer or whatever it is, or you, know, you could be uh, lying in bed, you could be having your breakfast anywhere, anytime, any place. You can access the material in theory on Moodle, and it could extend beyond what it does now, which is merely, in most cases, it's a repository for information. You could engage with it in a more meaningful way. Now, virtual schools have proliferated in different parts of the world. One place where they're quite prominent is in America. And uh, what I thought would be quite interesting is to have a look at a virtual school, uh, an actual virtual school that does exist. The thing you need to understand about virtual schools is they are exactly what they say they are. They're schools that you don't go to. These are schools that don't have buildings. Well, they may have a headquarters, but they don't have buildings like you went to school. They are um, schools that only exist in the ether. And you interact with them virtually. So this is Georgia Virtual School. It's um, sort of, there's a kind of little bit about the history of Georgia, Georgia School. The idea is, though, that somebody would go to Georgia School, uh, virtual school. They wouldn't attend a building. They wouldn't go to a place. But they'd have a regular timetable. They'd have to access what they were doing. They'd have material on there. They'd have interaction with a member of staff or somebody at the other end of a... Uh, usually, these are text-based schools, so you, you type in, uh, communicate through type. Um, and it's, it's grown because it's an alternative to schools. Okay? And people who home educate, and there are a small but increasing minority of people who educate their children at home, use virtual schools. Now, can you see the attraction for you, possibly, if you went to school, of a virtual school? Just think. We're Thursday morning, it's pouring with rain. You've got to go into school. Uh, you've got a half an hour's worth of journey. You get into school. You're being told what to do here, told what to do there. You've got a whole pile of people you're in the class with you don't like. The kids don't behave. You can't learn very much. And yet you go to this quiet place called a virtual school, and... You have interaction through that. You can control the interactions. You don't have to be in a physical location. OK, you have to follow a regular timetable. But it has certain attractions. Now, that's one aspect of uh, virtual education. And that's growing. And we have degrees of virtual education in all sorts of different forms. Now, the other thing I want to talk about is virtual worlds. And um, virtual worlds 
Uh, what I'll do is skip over that bit. I'll just give you a very brief introduction to uh, a virtual world. Well, this, I'll give you a couple of minutes on this, no more. This is called Second Life. In the United States, we spend over $815 billion per year on education. Yet education is increasingly viewed, especially by the emerging gamer generation, as ineffective, irrelevant, and unproductive. Clearly, it's time to rethink the method by which educators deliver knowledge to learners. Traditional lectures do little to hold the interest of a generation weaned on MTV and World of Warcraft. Enter Second Life, where learners become immersed in their own education. Second Life is a 3D virtual world that can provide and deliver a unique educational setting. Meet Ruth A. Boucher, Wiseau, and Marissa Moody. We are your guides to some exciting educational experiences happening in Second Life. Join us as we take you on a guided tour of some fascinating ways that the world of education is being transformed in this interactive virtual world. New visitors to Second Life are dropped at Orientation Island, where they are... I'm going to stop it there because it, it goes on for about 10 minutes, and basically you can get the thrust of the idea from there. Basically what happens in, in a virtual world is you have a character called an avatar, and you go into this virtual world, and it's like a game. But it's not a game, it's an educational purpose, it's got a more serious purpose. And you can get, engage with all sorts of different things. You can talk to other avatars in, in uh, cyberspace. You can uh, visit places that you've never visited before. You can take tours around universities. You can uh, practice things. They use uh, the virtual worlds a lot in medicine. Because obviously if you're training people to be doctors or nurses, and you live in, in a place where you don't have a training facility, it's very difficult to get the training to you, or you to go to the training in some cases. So they use a virtual simulation uh, for um, sort of exploring issues to do with medicine. And I've got one actually on the PowerPoint that I won't show now, uh, but you might want to look at, you, at it at your leisure. And the thing is, I want to say is this. Isn't the future of education going to be fantastic? Virtual worlds, augmented reality, enhanced... We know more about the way the brain works. We can, make, we can tinker, we can adjust, we can do all these kind of different things. But, you know, I'm not saying that because I think the future of education with new technology is going to be fantastic. I'm saying that because I think there are some issues. And some of the issues are really serious issues about who we are and what we think about education. And I think before we blindly accept technology as a benign thing, as a good thing, we need to step back and we need to ask about what's the purpose of education? And we need to ask that question in relationship to the use of new technology. And I just want to skip through a couple of things. Um, the first thing is this. If you have an augmented reality, a virtual school, who creates that school? Okay, and what's the quality of the experience like in that school for the individual who engages with it? And I just want to sh explain this. Cheshire is a doctor, and he went to Auschwitz. Now, Auschwitz, I'd be amazed if you didn't know what it was, but it was one of the extermination camps that were utilised in the Second World War to commit genocide, to get rid of a, a whole nation, a whole, a whole set of people. Um, and strangely enough, there are virtual worlds which are like Auschwitz. They, they're done for the best of reasons, uh, so people can have a virtual t tour, and they don't have characters in them, but... Cheshire, when he, when he thinks about this, he said he went to Auschwitz and he said, after a visit to Auschwitz, he suggests that scale is measured by the fingers gliding across a computer touchpad is not the same as distance measured by how fatigued one's legs feel after walking the full length of the grounds of Birkenau. The camp's physical proportions echo its moral proportions. Having recently walked there, the camp's dust is still clings to my shoes and the memories in my mind. What he's saying is, look, Virtual worlds are a substitute for the real thing. And in some cases, the impact of these real things is really profound. So we need to think very carefully about, great, you know, you can do these virtual tours in things like museums, but how, how much good is that actually doing? That's the first question I want to ask. The second thing I want to ask is, 
OK, here's to start any key, to start, press any key. Where is the any key? And this came from Socrates, or actually it came from Homer. And this is my friend Homer that it came from. And it's a kind of very simple question. But what it says, if you don't have the technology, you don't have the money to this, for this technology, you li exist in an area which I call di digital poverty. So you're excluded. So that exclusion is a very powerful thing. So when you say we'll embrace this or that for education, technology, you have to think about, you know, who does that exclude? So there are still people in this country who don't have broadband. There are still people who don't have access to uh, technology in all its sways. And, you know, particularly groups like the old, single-parent families, people on the poverty line. And yet the, lots and lots of our exchanges are done through technology. So I won't go into detail in that, but you need to think about the consequences for education. The third thing I wanted to do is say this. Look, you remember I said in Second World there's a thing called an avatar, and that avatar is a representation of you. And if you go into Second Life, you get a, a, an opening screen that says various things, but it asks you to choose an avatar. So my question to you is, there are about 15 avatars there, 15 representations of people. What do you think those avatars, who do you think they look like? Are they fat? Are they thin? Are they big? Are they small? Are they people who have, uh, you know, are there any wheelchair-bound individuals in there? Then the answer is no. They're all young. They're all photogenic. Okay, so in, if you became an avatar, it's not you. It's somebody else. It's a different persona. And, you know, how serious is that as, as an issue as well? Um, a couple of slides to finish off with. This is the heart of the matter. Postman said, we only assimilate, uh, suggest that we can only assimilate this tidal wave of technolo technological advance if the right kind of education is applied. So that then, there was a guy called uh, Backhurst who said, contends that the only right kind of education will only result if the right kinds of questions are asked. He believes that the questions will force us to confront the issues of what education is and ought to be. We must not let excitement about scientific innovation and technological possibility distort our conception of education and its values it ought to embody. My question is, is it too late? Is this technology so all-pervasive uh, that we don't have a choice anymore? You have to use the technology. And Neil Postman, again, in this particular book, said, it's a Faustian bargain that every advantage is tied to a corresponding disadvantage. Faustian uh, was a, a guy, it's, uh, mytholo well, it's, it's a, from literature, who basically made a pact with the, with the devil. And his pact with the devil was, uh, if you give me fantastic powers, I'll give you my soul. And in the end, the devil claimed his soul. Um, and are we in that state? We're fast, but the problem is this, that we're fasting approaching a state in which the disadvantages of technology are outweighed by the advantages. So is it too late to make decisions about the employment of technology in an educational context? Remember what I said at the beginning, cheaper, faster, smaller. So all the things I've talked about are going to accelerate in terms of where technology can, can impact on your life because they're getting cheaper, faster and smaller. But my final thing is, okay, this technology is fantastic, but what happens when somebody pulls the plug out? Okay, that's it. struggling to keep up then, but um, I think I've managed to identify six different areas of questions, so um, you know, bear in mind that we've got six rough questions to go through, so try and then deal with each area fairly briefly. Section. Do you like that? See what Morgan did to me there? He said, do it quickly because we've got to go. Go on, Morgan. Okay, well, um, the, the first question I've got for you is, um, and thanks for these questions, they're brilliant. Do you think that pen and paper will become redundant in schools because of new technology? Are, well, are, not finished. Are written exams going to become an outdated nonsense for people? And connected with this, do you think that teachers, not just pen and paper, will be replaced by machines? That's the, the, the final bit. I'm, that's a brilliant question, because <laughs> the final bit is really what I'm getting at. Is education about relationships? So I, I bounce it. Should it be about relationships? And if it's about relationships, imagine you're an avatar, an avatar pupil, and you go to uh, a virtual world school 
where the teacher is an avatar. You know, remember what I said about um, Cheshire, and he said, listen, when he went to Auschwitz, the thing that stuck in his mind were those physical sensations about being in Auschwitz, okay? Is education about relationships? And can you have genuine relationships in a, a virtual area? To go back to the pen and paper, yeah, I think the pen and paper is, is on its way out. If you go to primary schools and look at young children and look at the struggle they have with writing, it's phenomenal. They cannot write because they don't, you know, when, when five-year-olds were around 20 years ago, they didn't have whatever they have now. I can't remember the games because my son's in his 20s at the moment, so I've lost contact with five-year-olds. But, you know, five-year-olds have lots of handheld games. They have computers at home. They're typing. They're not writing. However, what I do think is there's going to be an emergence of two other forms of technology. One is, you know, the tablet pen, when you use a tablet computer and you use a uh, stylus to write on the screen, that's one. And the other thing is voice-activated uh, packages where you don't actually write. The interface between the person and the computer is the voice. And exams, I don't like exams anyway, so I would bound to say, yeah, it's a load of rubbish. Okay? Okay. Um, I've added my own little bit into this because a couple of times I noticed that you talk about technology and you use the word that impinge in relation to technology. You talk about technology impinging upon teachers. Um, and somebody asked the question, do you think that technology might lead to a situation where students in schools or colleges or universities, they become bored more easily? And do you think that, um, and you kind of answered this later on in the talk, but are we not a bit complacent about the damage that things like augmented technology might do to people? Yeah, I, and you know, it go, goes back to this relationship bit. Uh, it's, it's a... Uh, uh, I think, you know, there's a kind of human dimension to teaching or to, to teaching and learning that needs to be accounted for. Um, I actually think there's a slight reverse of that as well. That if we don't, and this I may run counter slightly to what I'm saying now, but if we don't embrace technology in the right kind of way, the generation after you, who are a generation who've grown up completely surrounded by technology, will go to school and listen to somebody talk. And unless that's, unless that's really good stuff, unless it's really powerful, they're really engaged, they'll go and play with their mobile phone. You know, how many of you, in one of these lectures, not necessarily mine today, have got your phone out and, oh, I don't understand what that word it means, and have actually gone and typed and gone onto the internet? You could end up in a situation where, you know, the person at the front is droning on and is really boring and you sort of, you go and explore these things for yourself. So we not only have to be very aware of the impinging of technology on, on education, we also have to use it. We can't ignore it. That's my other point as well. Actually, it's during your talk, I looked up the word avatar on the dictionary on my phone when you were speaking and it referred to the idea of a, a god or a deity coming down to us. And it made me think of... Um, that idea in, re in religion that God is, is up there, out there in space, and um, maybe another alternative view is that God is within us. Yeah. And, um, and maybe, therefore, the, the idea of technology and avatars is a, is a really unhelpful uh, metaphor um, to use in education. I think, yeah, the thing is with avatar, I think the origin of the word is there's some very clever guys who played around with this, and they, there's a kind of clever set of word connections there, which is why the word avatar is, is used. Um, when I talk about avatars, I don't think avatars are in, or the concept of avatars is entirely negative. You know, if, if, if there are people who are socially excluded for whatever reason, and if by engaging in a virtual world through an avatar or through a virtual school, that improves your connection with society as a whole, that's brilliant. Okay, um, this, I love this question. Uh, you talked about cognitive enhancers. Is there a danger that people will feel pressure to enhance their brain power in order, for example, to compete for jobs? Do you think that employers and schools might dish out these things yeah. in order to improve profits and come top of the tables? Um, and then somebody else texted in and said, do you think that this kind of technology is something that's going to increase inequality between the rich and the poor? Absolutely. The last bit is really, when you think about digital poverty, that's what I was getting at, really, is that you know, if you have access to the, to the technology, that's power. And, you know, the people who have access to some of this technology are the people who are the richest people in the world. Um, just remind me of the first bit of the question, because being a geriatric, I've forgotten what it was. Um, it was about um, people feeling pressure to take these yeah. um, technologies. Um, in order, so, you know, if, um, if you and I are competing for a job, then in order to beat you for the job, I'm going to take the pills. 
Yeah, actually, that's interesting. You know, not singing my own praises, but I've written a book about this, strangely enough. And one of the questions I pose in the book is this. It goes something like this. Imagine a school. A chemical company has gone to a school. And the chemical company has said, look, we've got this pill. It's the best thing since sliced bread. Give it to your kids. You'll improve your grades. You, you know, performance inside the school will be fantastic. And we'll give you free samples. And you can do it with all your kids. So what you do is you call a meeting of all the parents and you, you say to the parents, look, are you okay with this? And you get some people, and I think they would suspect to be in the minority, who'd say, yeah, that's absolutely fine. You would get some people who'd say cost, okay, exclusivity. You know, if my kids start taking this, do they need to take it all the time? And if they take it here, then when they go on beyond here, is the thing that they're going to reach for a pill? And you get another group who disagree on fundamental grounds because they say, you are what you are, you should not tamper with what you are. This goes, but remember the, the bit I talked about, about enhancement technology, this goes exactly right to the heart of that. That's a brilliant question as well. Okay, th this, this next one picks up on something that you must have mentioned that I didn't catch. But um, I think you talked about um, hearing aids at one point and, um, and uh, in, in connection with... Um, technological enhancement, and somebody texted and saying, um, the term you're looking for is, the, uh, is a cochlear implant. All right, I couldn't remember right, what it was. They link the ear to the brain, just like hearing people have linked ears to brains. Technology doesn't necessarily enhance, but it can just repair. Yeah. And you didn't seem to address that in your framework. Yeah, okay. I, I think I was using that simply because it was an e easy example for me to use. Um, yeah, um, one of the things I would say is that enhancement technology is not negative it can be very very benign and, and and sort of be very very useful where i think it we start to to uh, have issues that we need to think about very carefully is where somebody is perfectly healthy in one particular way so for instance you know you've got perfectly good eyesight there is a way of having an implant of some description that improves your eye, eye, eyesight beyond what you require normally to give you kind of and it may be a sports person or somebody like that you know an archer or somebody who's shooting or somebody requires sight so it's that kind of thing uh, and thinking about uh, you know going back to the enhancement technology as well with the drugs again the example I gave was Lance Armstrong now cycling as a sport um, it became the norm in the culture in which Lance Armstrong existed for his particular teams to take performance enhancing drugs if you didn't you were excluded in fact, there are examples, if you read some of the testi testimony associated with him, there are examples of cyclists who kicked off his team because they wouldn't take drugs. That was what somebody was referring to before about, uh, you know, pressure to perform. Okay, two more questions. Uh, they kind of go together, but I'll give you them one at a time. Um, human enhancement, you've just been speaking about this. One concern is that technology diminishes people. For example, calculators reduce mental arithmetic skills. Um, word processors um, automatically spell check and it reduces our skills there. So you were talking about the importance of relationships and this person's pointing out that um, another aspect of this might be that the individual skills and capacities that people develop as individuals then diminish our ability to have those relationships as well. Yeah, I think it's an, it's, it's an interesting one. I haven't really got an answer, uh, you know, a, a kind of convenient or comfortable answer to that. Because I kind of sit on both sides of that argument in a sense. On one hand, I think, you know, if you've got a spell checker there uh, and you can learn, it can improve your spelling simply by, um, you know, utilizing a, uh, a spell checker. So there is a kind of learning benefit from even using something like a, a spell checker. But on the other hand, uh, and th this is being somebody who, when I was at school, I couldn't spell to save your life. My spelling was absolutely appalling. And I now know the reason why, but it's, uh, it's taken me a long time to find out why. Uh, so, you know, a spell check, if it had been available for me, would have been a godsend. Because sometimes spelling gets in the way of ideas, and sometimes what you want to do is to get to the ideas. So I sit on both sides of that argument. I, re I haven't really got a very comfortable answer to it. Okay, last one, I think. Um, does communication technology, like, for example, using phones and texting, mean that real people in the, um, the real here and now, they talk to each other less than they used to. Um, this is in relation to virtual schools, and uh, uh, quite a few people texted in to say that um, these virtual schools seem to ignore the important social interaction dimension of, um, of education. Yeah, um, 
It's, I, I think that's a difficult question to answer. I mean, my, my argument is, well, actually, my argument, I'm not saying what my argument is, what I've designed this to do today is to be contentious to a certain extent. So what I think is hidden somewhere, you can work out what I think anyway, but it's to kind of throw out a few ideas out there. I'll, and again, this is one of these things, and I'm not trying to avoid the answer, but I think this is a complicated issue. On one hand, how many of you here could survive without um, social networks? Put your hand up. Put your hands down. That's remarkable because there's a quarter of the audience, that, uh, three quarters of the audience that couldn't survive without it. That's, that's remarkable. If I'd have asked you that question five years ago, I'd have probably got half the audience. Ten years ago, you wouldn't have known what I was talking about. So, social networks are a fact of life. Now, my son, I, I, I deliberately don't get involved in social networks for professional reasons, and one, because it would bore the hell out of me anyway. But my son, who's 25, says, look, uh, the only thing I use social networks for is to say, I'm going to be here at this particular point in time, do you want to come and have a beer? Blah, 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 blah. He said, any, any kind of meaningful communication, I don't have electronically, I talk to people. Now, whether he is unique or whether he's typical of the generation that you know, he represents, I don't know because I don't know enough about it. You're the people that can answer that. But you know, if I ask the question, how many people can survive without social networks and we only get a quarter of the audience, that tells you about the significance of them. But here's another question for you, so I'm booting this back in a sense. And the question is this. If you had a choice, talk to somebody face to face, use the phone or tweet or send a, an email, which would you do? And I think the answer would be to depend on the circumstances, wouldn't it? So in certain circumstances, you'd use uh, you know, uh, electronic web to technology. Other circumstances, you might use the phone. Other circumstances, it would be definite. You know, if, if your mate was breaking up with a girlfriend or boyfriend and they're saying, I'm desperate, I, you know, I'm never going to eat again, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> you'd, you'd, you'd kind of, you know, you'd think a cuddle might be a good thing and it's difficult to give you a cuddle through a tweet. Okay, so, you know, it depends on the circumstances. But I think social networking is here to stay. You can't eradicate it. We have to utilize it as educators. But what, what we have to remind kids, it's about touch, it's about feel, it's about, you know, the sensation of what's around you. And you can't replace that in an electro... Currently, and notice why I use the word currently, you cannot replace that sensation electronically. But with advances in our understanding of how the brain works, advances in relationship to the size of these things, who knows? Who knows what I would be saying if I was around in 10 years' time, what I'd be saying about technology and its impact on education. But this is my parting thing. You're the people, you're the generation that are the decision makers about this. And if you go into teaching, if you work in a situation where education is involved, step back once in a while and say, is kind of this technology everything that is purported to be, or should we just step back and think about it a little bit more? I'm done. Yeah, thanks, Tony.